265A, Quest to College, I'm Joe Vasta, and this is Review 3. So let's crank out some problems. Take the derivative. So when I take the derivative of this right here, I see what I have on this first term is a product. Now, this comes from page 236, which is review exercises. That's what the RE stands for. So this is a product rule. The product rule says the derivative of the first, which is 16x to the third, times the second, which is ln x. plus the first 4x to the fourth times the derivative of the second. The derivative of ln x is 1 over x. Okay, so that takes care of the product rule for that one. Now we're just going to zap this guy with the derivative gun. This is um, negative 4x cubed. So what we have is we have some cleanup work with algebra. So y prime equals 16x cubed ln x, this is plus 4x cubed minus 4x cubed. Those x cubes are out of there. And looks like my final answer for the derivative is 16 x cubed ln x. And so that was a derivative using product rule and I think it was just the product rule, wasn't it? Okay, let's go ahead and do our next problem. And I'll pull this problem off the review. This is number 16, review exercises. And so it looks like that. Go ahead and see if you can do the problem. I'm going to change that square root to the 1 half power. So this is 2x. Then we have x squared minus 2x plus 2. This is to the one half power. What am I going to do to take the derivative? I'm going to do the product rule. So there's the first, here's the second. Um, there's going to be a little chain rule mixed in there. So let's see if we can handle this. This is y prime equals the derivative of the first is 2 times the second. So we have x squared minus 2x plus 2 to the 1 half power plus, I'm doing the product rule, the first times the derivative of the second. The derivative of the second um, is going to involve the chain rule. So I have something to the 1 half. The derivative of that is 1 half something raised to the negative 1 half. And now I take the derivative of the something. The derivative of the something is 2x minus 2. Okay, that's the derivative of this right here. And then plus 0 if you'd like. Okay, so what do we have here? I'm going to go ahead and change this one half power to the square root. So I have 2 square root x squared minus 2x plus 2. Over here, we see that the 2's cancel. I'm going to bring that into a denominator and I'll switch that to a square root as well. So on the top, all I have is this x. We don't want to forget that. 
um, times 2x minus 2, that quantity. And on the bottom we have the square root of x squared minus 2x plus 2. I'm going to go ahead and put these two things together into one fraction. So we have to realize that this guy is over 1. Okay. So I'm going to multiply bottom and top of this one by the common denominator there, root x squared minus 2x plus 2. So that's what I'm going to do. So we'll do that right now. Square root x squared minus 2x plus 2. Square root x squared minus 2x plus 2. And of course, this guy is going to stay the way he is. So a lot of these problems, as you've discovered when you were doing your homework, require just some algebra. I mean, it's the algebra and the trig that kills us in a calculus class. So y prime is 2 times that right there. So we have um, square root times the square root. The square root goes away. And then over here we have plus x. We have 2x minus 2. This is all over that denominator. Okay, so we continue with this. Y prime equals, I'm going to distribute the 2 and distribute the x there. So 2x squared minus 4x plus 4 plus 2x squared minus 2x. This is all over the denominator. And I think, hopefully I'm almost done with this problem, I'll just combine some like terms on the top. When I combine them, I end up getting 4x squared and then minus 6x and then what else? We have a plus 4. This is all over the square root of x squared minus 2x plus 2. Okay, it's true that I can factor out a 2 out of the top. But that's not going to cancel with anything on the bottom. So we could just leave our answer like that and move on to the next problem. So let's move on to the next problem. Take the derivative of that function right there. Okay, before we um, actually take out our derivative gun, let's go ahead and write this out. This is the sine cubed. So there's a difference between these. The, um, this middle one says, really, sine x cubed. Whereas this last one says sine of x cubed, and I'll use parentheses around that argument. Okay, let's go ahead and take the derivative. The derivative of 5x is 5. Now this right here is the chain rule. I'm going to go ahead and look at this as something to the third power. The derivative of something to the third power is 3 times that something squared and that takes care of the three and remember maybe in the old days I would I would say okay we're done we, we've taken care of that three so 
what do I mean by the old days? I meant like in a previous video. I, I didn't mean this is like what we were doing in the 1800s um, between chasing a loop down the road with a stick. But, wow, well, where did that come from? Back to this. So we've just taken care of that three and now we just have to take the derivative of the sine x which is the cosine x. Okay now this one right here is also chain rule and I'm going to take the derivative of the sine of something. The derivative of sine something is the cosine of something. Okay, so I'll put some parentheses around there, and that takes care of the sine. Now I'm going to take the derivative of the something of the x cubed, which is 3x squared. The last thing I'm going to do, not much algebra or trig, just cleaning this up so it looks nicer. We should never have our coefficients right there. We should always put them in front. So let's do a clean up here. y prime equals 5 plus... 3, and then this is sine squared, so the, the way we usually write sine squared is sine, put the squared there. As much as you might hate that, that's just the way it's done. And then we have the cosine, x, and then this is plus 3x squared, I'll put the x squared there, and then cosine, x cubed. So there's the derivative. Let's go ahead and practice some more derivatives. That's the whole idea of this review is to just keep practicing problems. Problem number 22 from the review exercises. Um, find the derivative. So that's what we're going to do. So this right here is the chain rule. Y prime equals something to the one-third is one-third times the something raised to the negative two-thirds. How did I get negative two-thirds? I went one-third minus one. Okay, so we're breaking into this thing, so there we go. We can ignore that one-third, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say this is going to be multiplied by the derivative of this quotient. So we have to use the quotient rule. With the quotient rule, here's the top, here's the bottom. I'll put up a bracket here. I don't know why, just who knows, to capture it all. So the quotient rule says the derivative of the top times the bottom. So this is the cosine x plus 1 minus the top sine x times the derivative of the bottom. The derivative of cosine is negative sine and the derivative of 1 is 0 so we're not going to put that This is all over the bottom squared. And we'll finish off our um, bracket there. Now the rest of this problem, just like a lot of these problems, is cleanup work, either using, um, lots of times using algebra and then sometimes using some trigonometry. So y prime equals one third and so what I could do with this part right here is I can raise each of these to the negative two-thirds power so this is sine x to the negative two-thirds power and then this is cosine x plus one to the negative two-thirds power and inside these brackets, what do I have? I have the cosine squared, multiplying the cosine through, 
cosine squared plus cosine times one is cosine. And then this one is a two negative, so this makes a sine squared. This is all over the cosine x plus one quantity squared. Okay, look what we have in here. We have this guy right here. We have a cosine squared plus a sine squared. Do you remember what cosine squared plus sine squared is? Why well, that happens to be one. So there's a few things I'm gonna do on this problem. Keep the one third here. Um, those guys have negative exponents, so I'm gonna do cross the um, line change to the sign. I'll put a dot there. So on the bottom I have sine x to the two thirds. On the top I have cosine x plus one to the two thirds. Meanwhile, inside this big bracket, I have um, the cosine x on the top, and then the green part just becomes one. So cosine x plus one. And on the bottom, I have cosine x plus one squared. Okay. So what do we see in here? We see something that can reduce. Um, there is a cosine x plus one on top, and then there's two copies on the bottom, so this one's gonna cancel with that one. I'll just use another piece of paper here. So y prime equals Cosine x plus one to the two thirds. That's on top of this fraction. So we'll just make it all one fraction. And then we have a three. We have a sine x to the two thirds. And then this is cosine x plus one. And there's just one copy of it now. But look what I have on top. I have a cosine x plus one to the two thirds, and then this is cosine x plus one to the one. So there's gonna be some reducing on that. And I'm gonna actually have um, cosine x plus one to the one third on the bottom. Okay, because you can go one minus two thirds, bring that guy down. And so y prime equals this is just going to be a 1 on the top then, all over 3. I'm going to fix this one up a little, though with fractions some people would hesitate on this. Um, sine x to the 2 thirds power, I'm going to put that 2 thirds power right there. Some people go, oh, I don't like the way that looks. Well, we'll be on to the next problem. And then th this guy right here is the cosine x plus one to the one third power. Now if that last part made you nervous where we canceled, think of it like this, like if I had an a to the two thirds all over a, you, know, you might say, well, how do you do this problem? And some of you were taught to go like this, a to the two thirds minus one. And then that would have turned into a to the negative one third, which turns into one over a to the one third. So, I mean, that's kind of what I'm doing. We're playing the role of a is cosine x plus one. Well, in any case, here's your answer. The worst part of this, I think, was the algebra. I mean, once you have the chain rule down and the quotient rule, I mean, it's just stuff you do every time. And you have your derivatives, you know, what the derivative of the cosine and the derivative of the sine is. I mean, that stuff is just mechanical, and then, and then the rest is just doing this crazy algebra. Let's go ahead and do another problem. Our next problem is problem number 40 from the review exercises. 
So see if you can try out this problem and get a nice answer for this. Y prime is. Okay, what I'm gonna have to do here is the chain rule, and I might have to do the chain rule more than one time. The big picture is e to the something. What is the derivative of e to the something? Well, it's just, this one's the funnest one, e to the something. That takes care of the e. Now I'm just concentrating on the sine of the cosine, x. So really this is sine of something. What is the derivative of sine something? Well, it would be the cosine of something. So let's write that same something there. Now this is weird when you have the cosine of the cosine of x. It, it's, it's almost creepy, but let's continue. Get rid of that. And then we have to take the derivative of the cosine. The derivative of the cosine happens to be negative sine x. Our answer is almost good, except we have to clean up this negative. We usually, when there's a negative, we like to put it out front. So maybe we could have done that when we were writing this down, but I didn't want to lose anybody. So this is negative sine x, we have e, we have the sine of the cosine of x, and then this is multiplied by the cosine of the cosine of x. And even though cosine x is only one term for that argument, and I don't need the parentheses, usually when you're doing the sine of the cosine of the cosine of the cosine, you really want to put the parentheses, otherwise it, it just looks, it looks weird on your eyes. So there's the answer for this derivative. Let's go ahead and do another problem here. Here it is, number 48. take the derivative of this function. Okay, the derivative. Wow, so we gotta um, know our derivative rules, especially for um, 10 to something. So maybe in blue, the derivative of like 10 to the x is really gonna be 10 to the x, and then we have to put ln 10. So there's a rule there. Um, before I take the derivative, let's just rewrite this so um, we can put this 10th power on the sign like using parentheses just because it might be easier for the chain rule. So we have plus sine x. This is to the 10th power. And that's what that means. Okay, so the derivative. Th this right here is the chain rule, and so we're gonna do the chain rule here as well. Let's focus on this. The derivative of 10 to something. Well, we have that formula here. The derivative of 10 to something is 10 to the something multiplied by ln 10. That is the formula we have written there. You know, here was x, but we, right here we have sine x. Now, because we are doing the chain rule, we've just taken care of the 10 to the something. Now we just have to take the derivative of the sine, which is the cosine. Okay, you know, I'll, I'll put parentheses around this ln 10, so it doesn't look like I'm taking the ln of 10 cosine x. Because there's the first one. Plus, now we're going to take the derivative of sine x to the 10th power. So we're going to bring the 10 down, so this is really something to the 10th, which is 10 times the something. This is going to be to the 9th power. Using the chain rule, that takes care of that. And now I'm taking the derivative of the sine, which is the cosine x. 
So I'm going to clean this up very mildly. In fact, the last one could be boxed. I'm just going to go ahead and write this as 10 raised to the sine x ln 10 cosine x plus 10 times sine x to the ninth, so I'll put the 9 right there, and then this is cosine x. Okay, and so here's our answer. So, get the next problem here. Take the derivative of this. Well, the derivative of this has a variable in the base and a variable in the exponent. Your book sometimes calls these um, functions tower functions, but when you have a variable in the base and a variable in the exponent, you have to use logarithmic differentiation. So that's what we're going to do. Logarithmic differentiation says you, you ln both sides ln y equals ln x raised to the cosine 2x. Okay, the reason I did that is now I can rescue this person. Okay, this, this is the princess in the tower and she can jump out front. So look what I have. I have ln y equals so the cosine 2x jumps out in front. I'll put parentheses around there. And then this is going to be times the ln x. I'll put parentheses around there because what we're going to be doing when we take the derivative is the product rule. So I think it's time to take the derivative. d dx. The derivative of ln something is 1 over the something. We multiply that by the derivative of y with respect to x dy dx or just a y prime. And then over on the right hand side we're going to go ahead and do a little product rule here. The derivative of the first and that's going to require the chain rule. The derivative of the first derivative of cosine something is negative sine something. And then we have to um, take the derivative of the something, which is 2. So what are we doing? We are doing the product rule. The derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of ln x the derivative of the second and the derivative of ln x is 1 over x. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to multiply this whole equation by y because we're trying to find y prime in all these problems. So I have y prime equals y and let's clean this up just a little. Doesn't need much cleaning up. So we have um, negative two coefficients in the front. Sine two x ln x. And we have plus cosine two x all over x. So we almost would be done, except we like to write our y prime in terms of x's, and there's a y there. But look what we have here. We know what this y equals in terms of x. So we're going to just replace the yellow with the yellow. So y prime equals, I won't put a box around it now, x raised to the cosine to x times this junk right here. Now I've got to write this junk again, negative 2, sine 2x, ln x, plus 
cosine 2x over x. So we just we just took the derivative of this complicated function and we got this. Good thing we're not using the definition with the difference quotient because wow that would be a nightmare. But that's the underlying thing that's happening when we use all of our shortcuts. We really are taking the limit as h goes to zero and and stuff like that, but we don't really have to write that anymore. Okay, let's move on to the next problem, problem number 52 in the review exercises. And with problem number 52, we do see a log base three of something. So just as a reminder, because these are the ones that people tend to forget, if you took the derivative of log base three of x, it actually equals one over x. It's kind of like the ln, but then you also have to put an ln three. Okay, so see if you can do this problem. Okay, it's gonna require some chain rule. Taking the um, derivative of log base three of something, which is really gonna be one over, see, here's the something here, one over the something. times the ln3. And that's how you take care of log base 3. It's one of the ways. And now we are doing the chain rule. Now I have to take the derivative of x, x plus 8, which is just 1 plus 0. And now it would have almost been good if I didn't put that. Now I have to um, clean up my answer because I did that. So this is 1 over x plus 8 times the ln 3. Okay, our next problem is this one right here. Number 60. Take the derivative of this function looks really nasty. And what we're going to use, we're going to use logarith logarithmic differentiation. So on the exam, I will tell you, use logarithmic differentiation. That's what I'd like to, you to use if I ask. Um, the other way is to use the quotient rule with the chain. It's going to be a really big mess of algebra. This is going to be messy the way I'm going to do it, but it's probably not as bad. So logarithmic differentiation says I ln both sides. Ln y equals the ln of this chunk, x squared plus 1 cubed all over x to the fourth plus 7. Some of you have done a few of these problems, so you would have known to skip the step maybe. Maybe you would have skipped it. So I'm now going to use properties of logarithms to make the right hand side look a little simpler okay so it, it doesn't have powers and things like that so the first thing i'm going to use is the quotient rule for logarithms ln y equals what the quotient rule for logarithms says the log of a quotient is the difference of the logs so this is going to be ln x squared plus one cubed minus ln x to the fourth plus seven to the eighth two x plus one to the seventh. So that's what we did the quotient rule for logs and now what we're going to do here is we have the um the log of a product which is the sum of the logs so I'm going to use the product rule for logarithms. So ln y equals ln x squared plus 1 cubed. And I'm going to just leave the negative right there and use the product rule here. So this is ln 
x to the fourth plus seven raised to the eighth plus, so that's the product rule, ln 2x plus 1 to the seventh. My next step is I'm going to distribute that negative sign. So this is ln y equals ln x squared plus 1 cubed minus ln x to the fourth plus 7 to the eighth power minus distributing the negative ln 2x plus 1 to the seventh power. I have not done any calculus yet. Okay, I've, I've ln both sides of an equation and I'm doing properties of logs. Now I'm going to use the power rule for logarithms. Make this 3 jump in front of the logarithm. So ln y equals 3 ln x squared plus 1 minus, okay, the 8 jumps in front, 8 ln x to the fourth plus 7 minus, because that minus is there, the 7 jumps in front, 7 ln 2x plus 1. Whew, lots of properties of logarithms. I'm trying to find another piece of paper here. Get ready for the change. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and multiply. Or no, I'm not going to multiply. I'm going to um, apply the derivative to both sides of the equation. D, dx. Okay, so this is where I need a new piece of paper here. So the derivative of ln something is 1 over something times the derivative of something, the derivative of y with respect to x is dy dx or y prime. Okay, so this is going to equal, I'm taking the derivative of this right here. This is going to require a little bit of chain rule. So we have the derivative with a constant. We put the constant there, and now I'm going to take the derivative of ln something. The derivative of ln something is 1 over that something. That takes care of the ln, so now we're just taking the derivative of um, x squared plus 1, which is 2x. Okay, moving on to here, we have the minus 8. The derivative of ln something is 1 over the something. And then we have to take the derivative of the something, which is 4x cubed. Then we have minus 7, and we do the same thing here. The derivative of ln something is 1 over the something. And then we take the derivative of the something, the derivative of 2x plus 1 is 2. Okay. So like that. That right over there. Now I'm going to go ahead and multiply both sides by y. Because we just want to have y prime by itself. So y prime is by itself. And what we have is we have y times this junk here. So you'll have to excuse my laziness. I'm going to go ahead, because I know I'm going to have to write it in the next step. I'm just going to say junk. And the reason I'm doing that is because I can replace y with the original function. See this y right here? I'm going to replace it with that. So this is x squared plus 
1 cubed. So I'm just copying this down. And on the bottom we have x to the 4th plus 7. This is to the 8th. And then 2x plus 1 to the 7th. And then I'm going to go ahead and write out the junk and I'm going to be simplifying things on the way. So hopefully you saw that this guy right here got replaced because that's what it was. It was our original problem. Okay, let's simplify the junk. This first part on the top I have 6x. 6x all over x squared plus 1. And then over here, it looks like I have negative 32, so minus 32x cubed all over x to the fourth plus 7. And then over here is a minus 14 over 2x plus 1. And that completes this problem. logarithmic differentiation. Let's go ahead and do another problem. Evaluate this. So this says take the derivative of this function and then plug x equals zero in after you're done with the derivative. Okay, the derivative of tangent d dx of tangent inverse actually. Well, this happens to be 1 over 1 plus x squared. So there's the formula for that. And what I'm going to do on this problem is I'm going to just start off by saying y equals this function. Tangent inverse and then I'll put the argument around parentheses because that will help us psychologically when we're doing the chain rule. Okay the derivative I have to take the derivative of tangent inverse of something. Well the derivative of tangent inverse is 1 over 1 plus something squared. So this is 1 over 1 plus something squared. Doing the chain rule so we can ignore that. Now I'm taking the derivative of e to the something. Okay, so my something keeps changing when I'm doing multiple chain rules. e to something, the derivative of e to something is e to something. And that gets rid of the e. Now I'm taking the derivative of negative x, which is negative 1. So y prime is, we'll clean it up a little, we have a negative e to the negative x all over 1 plus, um, we have a power to a power, so we multiply e to the negative 2x. Now they did not ask for the derivative, they asked for us to evaluate the derivative at x equals zero, so I'm not going to worry about trying to um, put positive exponents into here, I mean that's going to be lots of algebra. What they want is they want me to evaluate this at x equals zero, and there's notation for that, there it is. So we have minus e, now if they ask us to evaluate it at x equals one, then yes, there would be some work to do. Um, negative 0 is just 0. And then on the bottom we have 1 plus e to the um, negative 2 times 0 is 0. So I have negative 1 on the top because e to the 0 is 1 and then um, 1 plus 1 on the bottom. So it looks like my final answer is going to be negative 1 half. So there was the evaluation of that derivative at zero.
Let's go ahead and do number 66 from the review exercises. And here's number 66. It says find y double prime. So on the exam and in your homework, there is notation for second derivative. It's y with two little prime marks or it could be d2y dx2. We went over why that was the case. So we're trying to find the second derivative here. And to find the second derivative, you need to take the first derivative. And this is gonna be the chain rule. The derivative of e to something is e to something. Okay, that gets rid of the e. And when I say that gets rid of it, I just mean we, we cross it out so we don't have to look at it anymore when we're taking the derivative. It's still there. Okay, what's the derivative of the something? Well, the derivative of the something is 2x plus 0, or we'll just say 2x. So let's clean up this first derivative. So it says 2x e to the x squared plus 1. There's the first derivative, and they wanted us to take the second derivative. So if you're going to take the derivative of this, you notice that what you have here is a product. There's the first function. There's the second function. So I'm going to do the product rule for derivatives, which would be this. The derivative of the first times the second. plus the first times the derivative of the second. The derivative of the second is a little chain rule. It's e raised to the x squared plus 1, and then you take the derivative of the something or the exponent, and that's 2x. In fact, we did the derivative of this thing. That was our original function. So the second derivative equals to e to the x squared plus 1 plus, looks like there's 4x squared there, e to the x squared plus 1. Now I was about to skip that and jump on to another answer because I'm lazier. You might see the book do this sometimes. Um, when I saw this, I saw that they each had an e to the x squared plus 1, so I was just going to factor that out. This is a matter of style. You don't have to do this. And then I also saw there was a 2 in common, so I factored out a 2, which means on this one I just, just have a 1 there as a placeholder, plus, and then over here, I guess it would be a 2x squared. Now the reason why you might do that, especially maybe if there were five terms, is maybe you don't want to write this e to the x squared plus 1 five times if there were five terms. So this is also acceptable as well. And that completes problem number 66. Let's take a look at problem number 70. Problem 70 from the review exercises. Find y double prime. So we've got a sine y and a y here, so this means we'll probably have to do implicit differentiation. Gonna hit both sides with the derivative gun with respect to x. The derivative of x is 1. The derivative of sine y is the cosine y. But because you are taking the derivative with respect to x, now you have to put a little marker, which is a y prime. Now the derivative of y is 1 y prime. So we'll just put the y prime right there. So that we have, take, we've taken the derivative of both sides of that equation. I'm going to go ahead and put the cosine y y prime on the right hand side. So I have 1 equals y prime minus the 
cosine y, y prime. Now, why did I do that? It's because I want all my y primes on one side and my non y primes on the other side so I can factor out a y prime and then divide and then I would have solved for y prime. Um, let's go ahead and factor out that y prime. y prime. One minus cosine y in parentheses. And then I'm going to divide. So this is one over one minus cosine y. This equals y prime. And I don't need to box it anymore because I'm not going to lose it. So I'll write it in a conventional fashion where I put the thing that I'm solving for on the left hand side. y prime equals 1 over 1 minus the cosine of y. That's the first derivative. They asked me for the second derivative. To find the second derivative, um, probably going to have to do the quotient rule. There's other ways we can do this. We can bring the 1 minus cosine y up, put a negative 1 power around there, and do the chain rule on that. You will get the same result. I'm going to just do the quotient rule. So y double prime is the derivative of the top, which is 0, times the bottom, which is a bit pointless to write, but I'm going to write it anyway. Minus, why is it pointless to write? Because I'm multiplying it by 0. So minus the top times the derivative of the bottom. The derivative of cosine is negative sine. But this is 1 minus cosine, so that's a 0 there. And the derivative of negative cosine is positive sine. So we have sine of y, and let's not forget the y prime. Why do we need the y prime? Because we have just taken the derivative with something with y in it. And this is with respect to x, so this is really a dy dx. Quotient rule, derivative of the top times the bottom minus the top times the derivative of the bottom. This is all over the bottom squared. Now I could use another piece of paper, but I have a whole nice blank spot right here, so I'm going to um, move on up over here. I'm going to try to clean this up. So y double prime equals, well, the zero is gone, so I'm going to have a negative y prime. times the sine of y on the top. And on the bottom, I'm going to have 1 minus cosine y quantity squared. Now, our answer could not have a y prime in it, so we're going to have to replace that y prime with what y prime is. So didn't we say y prime was this right here? So we're going to go ahead and replace that. Is it going to make a mess? Absolutely. So let's go ahead and see what this mess turns into. So negative, and then we have the y prime. So I'll just put a negative one there, and then y prime is one over one minus cosine y. And then over here, so this is multiplied, multiplied. Okay, so that was the yellow part. which smeared right there, by the way. And then we have the sine y. This is all over the bottom, which says 1 minus cosy squared. Okay, so what do we have on the top? We have minus sine y all over 
1 minus Kazi. And really, you know what? This guy right here on the bottom, he's a fraction. It's this thing over 1. So I'm going to do a copy dot flip. So here's my dot, and then I'm going to flip. I'm not going to flip. Okay, so if you're thinking that I was flipping, then, then how dare you think that about me? Okay, so watch this. So this is squared on the bottom. And so look, I have like another one right here. It's the same exact thing. It's kind of like saying x times x squared, which is really x cubed. So I'm going to have a cubed on the bottom. So my second derivative looks like it's pretty much done. Minus sine all over 1 minus cosy or is it cozy? I don't know. Cozy would have a z. This is cubed. And we have just taken the second derivative involving an implicit differentiation problem. And now we'll move on to the next problem. Problem number 76. Review exercises. Find the tangent line at the point 2, 1 of this right here. So some of you are like, I have trust issues. You know, I don't trust people. My heart was broken a year ago or whatever. And so you don't trust anybody. So if you're one of those people then plug this in there to make sure that that point really is on the curve. <laughs> that would be funny if it wasn't. I, that would be a time where I would actually pause the video and cut that part out. But I think it's going to be, look at this, 2 squared, which is 4. 4 times 1, so 4 plus 1 cubed. So 4 plus 1 is 5. Okay, so that point is on that curve. We're trying to find the tangent line at the point on the curve. We don't have to draw a picture or anything, we just have to um, find out what y prime is. Because what is y prime? y prime describes slope. So if you have a formula for y prime, you plug that into the formula, you get the slope, you'll have a slope and this point which you can go y equals mx plus b. So that's what we'll do. Implicit differentiation. I'm going to hit both sides of this equation with the derivative gun. Things don't look so good for that 5 over on the right hand side. He's, he's already crying. I can hear him weeping very quietly. This is going to be a product rule. The derivative of the first, which is 2x. Now we don't have to put an x prime because really you're going dx over dx, which is just a 1. So you don't have to put that. The derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. The derivative of y is 1. And then you have to go dy dx, which is just a y prime. If you've been doing your homework, you know what I'm talking about here. So that is the derivative of x squared y plus the derivative of y cubed is 3y squared and then put your little marker there y prime. Now why was the 5 crying because it just got zapped with the derivative gun and it's like ah, it's 0 it's nothing. Let's go ahead and solve for y prime. This guy right here he really doesn't belong on this side, does he? On the left-hand side, he does not have a y prime. So we'll knock him over to the right-hand side. This is going to be negative 2xy. These two terms, they each have a y prime in them, so I'm going to factor out that y prime. And I'm going to have x squared plus 3y squared. And that equals the negative 2xy. I'm going to divide both sides by the x squared plus 3y squared. So this is going to give me y prime equals negative 2xy all over 
x squared plus 3y squared. And that, that's not the answer. It would have been if they just said find y prime, but, but what they're asking for is the tangent line at that point. So now we want to plug this point into this expression. Now the fancy way of doing that is going y prime and then we put a line and then we put the point here. It's kind of weird, you know, a weird notation, but you'll get used to it if you keep taking technical classes. So I'm plugging that point, x is 2, y is 1, into this expression. So this is negative 2 times x, which is 2, times y, which is 1. This is all over x squared, which is 2 squared, plus 3 times y squared. I better just use parentheses there. So on the top we have negative 4, and on the bottom we have 4 plus 3, which is 7. So that there is the slope. Don't you hate when the slope is a fraction? Well, it happens sometimes. So you have a point of 2, 1, and you have a slope of negative 4 sevenths. And you are to find the tangent line. Now, our tangent line looks like this. I mean, all lines except um, vertical lines look like y equals mx plus b. There are four letters, two variables, those would be x and y, and two constants, those would be m and b. And we know one of the constants, so guess what? y equals negative 4 sevenths x plus b. Okay. So two approaches. One approach is um, just guess. Okay, B is 13. That's usually a bad method because you're usually going to get that, the, the problem wrong when you do that. In fact, 13 is not the answer. So the other approach is plug that point into the equation. Okay, so X and Y are variables. This is one instance. So the one X is 2 and Y is 1. So um, 1 equals negative four sevenths times two plus b. One equals negative eight sevenths plus b. Um, let's go ahead and just add the eight sevenths to both sides. I was going to multiply the equation by seven, but you know what? I'm feeling pretty tough today. So this is eight over eight plus, I know it's eight over eight. Okay, it's, I'll just write it out. Seven over seven plus 8 over 7. It is true that 1 is 8 over 8, but I didn't really need to um, consider that. So what does b equal? b equals 15 over 7. So we now know the two constants m and b. The tangent line will then look like this. y equals negative 4 sevenths x plus 15 sevenths. There's the answer. Well, that was real fun. <laughs> and the fun's going to continue. So um, how does the fun continue? I don't know how the fun continues. I'm trying to find my related... Ah! Okay, so here's the related rates problem. We're going to do a few related rates problems now. Okay, and that's how the fun continues. I took this right off the um, homework sheet. We have DC, DT. So the C is going to be the circumference. This is a circle. Okay, so hopefully that helps. You're like, oh, thanks for clearing that up. The circumference is changing at 4 feet per second. The radius is 8 feet. So it's changing as well, but it, at this moment in time, it's 8 feet, and they want us to find the um, change in the area. So what do we need to do this problem? Well, we're trying to find DA, DT, so let's crank out a formula that has the area of a circle in it. The area of a circle is pi r squared. And... Let's color code these things, because that's what I've been doing, DC, DT. We'll make it red. And 
and R equals 8 and blue. So what I usually do is I'm going to go ahead and hit both sides of this equation with the derivative gun, but this time it's the derivative with respect to time. which is measured in seconds in these problems. So the derivative of a is 1, and then you're taking it with respect to t, so we have dA dt. This equals, now remember pi is just a constant, but the r squared is what we're concerned with. So the derivative of r squared is 2r, so this is going to be 2 pi r, and because we're taking the derivative with respect to t, we go dr dt. So we take out our colors here, and we see that, look at this one, this one, we have that one right there. We're trying to find dA dt, that's our goal. 2 pi, that's going to be 8. Ah, so what is that? We're going to go ahead and um, use another color. We don't know what that is. So is there another formula that we know with a circle that maybe has the circumference in it? And the answer is yeah, hopefully. The circumference is 2 pi r. Okay, I'm going to hit both sides of this equation with the derivative gun. And this gives me dc dt equals um, constant times r, the derivative of that is just constant, and then dr dt. And so I know this one right here. I know that this guy can get replaced with a 4. So we have a 2 pi there. And then this guy right here, dr dt, that's the one that I need to know when I come back over here. So I'm going to um, divide both sides by 2 pi. When I do that, I end up getting 2 over pi equals dr dt and keep them with the color coding that one's green and so da dt equals 2 pi r that's 8 see right there and then dr dt is um, 2 over pi. The pi's cancel and you have eight, um, 8 times 2 which is 16 times 2 which is 32. So we'll come over here and we'll say dA dt equals 32. Now it's important that we get our units. We must put units. The area is measured in um, not feet, but squared feet, or feet squared, you can say. Feet squared, so that's the area per time, and this is seconds. You can see that because it's a second right there. So there's our answer right here. This is dA dt related rates. Okay, let's go ahead and do problem number seven. Related rates, right triangles. So this comes from that homework handout. Um, let's go ahead and draw that right triangle. So here's theta, x, y, z. They've given us some information here our right triangle is changing and um, side x because there's a negative one there it's decreasing in length a negative one feet per second so what we'd like to do is we'd like to color code these the color coding it really changed it for me when I was trying to learn related rates so I'm gonna circle that in a color like brown so that way um, if I need it I can find it dz dt, that's the hypotenuse. It's actually growing four feet per second. So four feet per second, we'll um, circle that in orange.
at a snapshot in time, you have x equals 4, which I'll circle in blue. So that doesn't mean that x is fixed. In some of these problems it says one of these sides is fixed, which means it's not changing. x is changing, but at this snapshot in time, it is 4 feet. And z, so like, you know, 3 seconds from now, it would, it would actually be less because it's changing, it's getting less. Okay, and then on um, Z in this snapshot in time, it is five and I'll make that in purple. So in this problem, we're to find these four rates of change and let's just tackle them one at a time. The first one that I'm um, asked to find happens to be dy dt. So that's my goal. So do I know any formulas for this triangle? Yes, I knew, I know a few of them. I know the perimeter, which is going to probably be involved on this one. So I don't want to put that formula up yet because I'm trying to find dy dt. I know the area, which will probably be used there. I also know some things with trig and we'll, we'll do that there. But the, the Pythagorean theorem is what I'm looking for. And the Pythagorean theorem says, x squared plus y squared equals z squared. And that's the one that I want to hit with the derivative gun. So the derivative gun is d dt. So the derivative of x squared is 2x. And then I have to put a dx dt. plus the derivative of y squared with respect to t is 2y dy dt. And the derivative of z squared is 2z dz dt. Now I'm going to scale down this equation by multiplying the equation by 1 half just to get rid of those twos. So I end up getting x dx dt plus y dy dt equals z dz dt. So now using the colors, let's go ahead and replace the dx dt with a negative one. So I'll circle that in brown. And the z dt, this guy right here, the one I'm actually solving for is dy dt. There's six variables in this equation. x at this instant in time happens to be 4, so circle that, and z is this right here. Now it seems as if, like, if I'm trying to solve for dy dt, I would also need to know what y equals at this instant in time, and it seems like it's missing. But what we can do is we have this equation, x squared plus y squared equals z squared. And we know at this moment in time that x squared is 4, oh sorry, that x is 4, so we have 4 squared plus and then we have y squared, and then z is 5, so 5 squared. So this is 25 and 16, so y squared equals 9. y is going to equal plus or minus 3, but it's a length, so 3. So y equals 3 at this moment in time is good, because now we can replace that. I think a common thing that people do when they when they work related rates problems is they they know that x is 4 and um, z is 5 and they will go ahead and put that in this equation before we hit it with the derivative gun. Well if you just put 4, 5, and 3 into this equation you'd end up getting um, 25 equals 25 and there would really be no calculus involved and then you would have defeated the purpose. So let's go ahead and plug these different colors in here. So we have a 4 here, the brown is negative 1, then we have 3, and 
and dy dt, this equals z, which is 5, and then the orange one is 4. So let's see, this is 20 here, and then we're going to add 4, so that's going to be 24 on the right hand side. This is 3 dy dt. So now we know what dy dt is, and we're almost coming off the paper here. dy dt is 8, and we have to say the units. Um, y is measured in feet, so this is going to be 8 feet per second. And so there is the answer to the first problem, dy dt. And we're going to continue this on another piece of paper. So hopefully it's, I got this other piece of paper here. And the next thing we want to know is DA DT. So that's our goal. So do I know any formulas that involve this right triangle and the area? Yeah, I do. The area of a triangle is one half base times height. So the area of this triangle, here's the base x and the height is y, so it's going to be one half base times height x times y. So here is an equation that we can now, we don't want to plug x equals 4 and y equals 3 in there. We want to, because the x and y are still variables and they're changing as time changes. So we're going to hit this thing with the derivative gun on both sides. The derivative with respect to t. d dt. So the derivative of a with respect to t is dA dt. This is going to equal, we're going to go ahead and do product rule here. We'll just say that's the first function there and the second function is there. So the derivative of the first is one half and then because we're doing this derivative with respect to t we're going to say dx dt. Okay, so that's the derivative of the first times the second plus the first, which is one half x, times the derivative of the second. The derivative of y with respect to t is one and then dy dt. So at this moment, we can plug things in. We know dx dt. We know y, I think y was the green one here, so we'll, we're color coding it here. We know x, and dy dt, isn't that the one we just figured out? dy dt, so we'll, a new color we'll use will be red. So let's plug these things in. We have um, dat dt equals one half times negative one and then I believe the y was a three yeah it was plus one half x is four and dy dt is eight so this gives me negative three halves and the other one's going to be 32 over 2, so that's 16. But maybe it's best to keep it as 32 over 2. So it looks like my final answer is 29 over 2 feet squared per second. Okay, so that's what we have for dA dt, and I used feet squared, why? Because it's an area, 
and then the time is measured in seconds. Okay, let's go ahead and do the next one. So we found dy dt, dA dt, new piece of paper. We're now going to find d theta dt, and that's the one that some people hate. They say, oh, I don't like d theta dt. Well, why don't we go ahead and put these guys up, up higher, because I had to keep moving the paper around, so y equals 3, and dy dt equals 8. We'll say this is feet per second, this is feet. So we'll color code them with the same colors. Usually not into color coding that much, but on these problems it really helps. I mean, it'd be, I'd be lucky just to get my shirt matching with my pants or whatever. So, I mean, I'm not a big fan of that, but here it has to be done. Okay. So d theta dt, that's what we're going to do on this piece of paper here. Now, we need an equation that has a theta in it. And actually, we can come up with six different equations because we have the sine, cosine, tangent, cosecant, secant, and cotangent. But the one, well, there's one of two that I would use this, the sine and the cosine because those derivatives are pretty simple. So, you know, any of those six trig ratios will give you the same answer that I'm about to get. But I think I'm going to go with the sine because the sine is um, the easiest to take the derivative of. So that's what I'm going to have here. I'm going to say sine theta equals. Now, you can do this Sokotoa, but I'm, I'm bad at spelling. So I'm going to say Oscar had a hunk of apples. Oscar had. So opposite over hypotenuse. Opposite is y over hypotenuse, which is z. So, you know, theta is a variable, z is a variable, y is a variable, and your question is, would you rather do the quotient rule or the product rule? Because right now, if you zap both sides with the derivative gun, you'll be doing the quotient rule, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm just going to, I don't feel like doing the quotient rule, I'm going to go ahead and multiply both sides by z, so I'm going to have z sine theta equals y, and then that avoids the quotient rule. I still have to do the product rule. I'm going to hit both sides of this equation with the derivative gun, d dt. And here it goes. This is the derivative with respect to t. So product rule. There's a product right there. The derivative of the first, dz dt, times the second, sine theta, plus the first, which is z, times the derivative of the second. So the derivative of sine something is going to be cosine something, cosine something. And then the derivative of theta with respect to t is d theta dt. So that takes care of the derivative of the left hand side, the derivative of the right hand side, the derivative of y with respect to t is dy dt. Okay, so we can start circling some of these things in colors, but the problem is going to be with the sine theta and the cosine theta. I don't know what color the circle goes in. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this triangle. And, and I'm going to write this again. So this is dz dt multiplied by sine of theta is opposite over hypotenuse. So this is y over z plus, and we have a z here cosine of theta is adjacent over hypotenuse, so x over z so we've just replaced the cosine with x over z and then we have d theta dt d 
this equals dy dt. Now it's true, I can go ahead and say let's solve for d theta dt, but we don't need to do that. I'm just going to go ahead and plug some, um, some values in for these variables. One thing you may have noticed is that the z's cancel. But if you didn't notice that, and you plug the z in there, you would figure it out. You'd, you would end up canceling some number then. Okay, so let's take a look at our color, color coding here. We have dz dt. Okay, so that's orange. And y is green. Z is purple. X is blue. We don't know what d theta dt is, but that's what we're looking for. And dy dt is red. Okay, so we're kind of running out of space here with, within the range of the camera. I keep thinking about that. D, z dt is 4. Okay, and then we have multiplied by 3 fifths. We can cover up the purple a little. Then we have plus x is 4 d theta dt. This equals 8. And so I think we can just continue without looking at the picture. This gives me what? What have we got here? Well, I've got this. Let's just keep going here. 12 fifths plus 4 times this variable, d theta dt, equals 8. I'm going to multiply everything in the, both sides of the equation by 5 because I'm not a big fan of the fraction there. So this gives me 12 plus, because the 5's cancel, 20 d theta dt equals 40. I have a little space over here so I'm going to take advantage of it. It's 20 d theta dt equals 28 d theta dt equals 28 over 20, and that reduces, I think, 4 goes into each of those. So d theta dt equals 7 fifths. Now, what are the units going to be on this? Well, theta, what is that measured in? Now, a lot of you want to say, maybe, oh, that's measured in degrees, but degrees gets a little bit clumsy, especially when we're graphing trig functions and things like that. So when we don't really want to have something there, you know, we don't have that degree there, if we don't have degrees in here, we are going to say radians. Radians and then the time is second. So um, the theta is changing by 7 fifths radians per second. And that's the answer for d theta dt. Okay, so we almost have them down here. Have them all covered. The only one we did not do is dp dt. That's the perimeter. And do we know what the perimeter is of that triangle? Yes, the perimeter is taking a walk around the triangle. This is x plus y plus z. This one's not going to be as traumatic as the last one. Let's go ahead and hit this equation on both sides with the derivative gun. The derivative of p with respect to t. So this is going to be straightforward here. dp dt equals dx dt plus dy dt plus dz dt. And we'll use our color coding here. dx dt is brown. 
dy dt is red, dz dt, well that's orange. Okay, so let's add these together. We have negative one plus eight plus four. So that's 12 minus one, which is 11. Now what's perimeter measured in? Well, perimeter in this example is measured in feet, feet, and then time is seconds, feet per second, or feet per second. And there it is. That's the related rates, right triangles, number seven. We figured out all the four things they were asking us to do. Let's move on to another problem. Okay, so our next problem is another related rates problem. And it has to do with a rope, which is attached to the bottom of a hot air balloon that is floating above a flat field. And so that's what we are doing. This is 113, we're back in the review exercises again. And so we wanna figure out um, the answer to this problem. If the angle of the rope to the ground remains 65 degrees, so that's fixed, and the rope is pulled in at five feet per second, how quickly is the elevation of the balloon changing? So someone's trying to bring a, a hot air balloon down by pulling the rope and always keeping the angle at 65 um, degrees. So I think what I need to do is I need to go get my ruler. See how well prepared I was? Okay, so let's go ahead and draw this picture here. I'm gonna go ahead and draw the ground. They do say a flat field. There's a hot air balloon and 65 degrees. So there's a rope that looks like this. And mine might not look like 65 degrees, but well, just, oh, and I smeared that right up there. Here's the hot air balloon. 65 degrees is fixed and the rope is being pulled in. So there's a person down here and they're pulling in that rope. Okay. So of course this is going to create a right triangle. And it seems like this guy's here He's pulling in the rope, so things are going to be changing. I mean, here's Y. We'll make that Y, and we'll make this X, make this Z. Okay. If the angle of the rope to the ground remains 65, which we have, and it says the rope is, is pulled in at 5 feet per second. So here's the rope right here. Z represents the rope. And it's telling you the rate of change of the rope, five feet per second. Now the deal is, if I just went dz dt equals five feet per second, something would be wrong with that. And what would be wrong with that is the fact that it's not increasing by five feet per second, it's being pulled in, so it's getting shorter. So dz dt is actually negative five feet per second. How quickly is the elevation? Okay, so what is the elevation in terms of the balloon? Well, the elevation is gonna be Y. How quickly is that changing? So our goal is dy dt. So there it is. So do we know an equation that might hook together the 65 degrees, the y, and the z. Well, think trig ratios, and perhaps you think the sine equals the opposite over the hypotenuse. So I'm gonna write that. The sine of theta equals the opposite and y is changing and so is z over 
the hypotenuse. So there's the equation that we're going to go with. Now, because I don't want to do the quotient rule, I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation by z. z times the sine of 65 degrees. Sine of 65 degrees is just a constant. This equals y. I'm going to hit both sides of this equation with the derivative gun, d dt. And the derivative of a constant times z is just that constant. So sine 65 degrees. But because I'm taking the derivative with respect to t, I have to write dz dt. The derivative of y with respect to t is dy dt. So when I was looking at this problem, I was getting a little worried because it, it seemed like they weren't giving us what y equals or what z equals. And, and really, in order to answer this question, we don't really need to know that. Color coding things, let's just call the dz dt negative 5. It's really the only one we need. And what we're looking for is dy dt. That's our goal. So this is just sine 65 degrees times a negative 5. This equals dy dt. So we're pretty much, we're almost done with this problem here. So you would have to put this into your calculator, making sure your calculator was in degrees because that's the way they gave it. They didn't give us radians, they gave us degrees and you would hit sine 65 and you'd multiply that by negative five. And then um, they didn't tell you where to round the answer. So usually on a test, you don't round your answer um, unless you're asked to round your answer. In the book, they always like to give these problems and then when you look at the back, Oh, they round to like one decimal plate and they never told you. So books are very bad at telling you where to round. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to round this to one decimal plate. So this is just me punching this into the calculator. I end up getting, so I'll put the answer over here. So dy dt. And since I'm rounding it, I'm going to say this is approximately equal to, and I'll round it to the nearest um, tenth. Okay. I ended up getting negative... 4.5 okay, when I plug that into the calculator. Now what is this measured in? Y is measured in, well we see feet there, so feet per second. And it makes sense because the altitude is changing, it's getting less because someone's pulling the rope in. And so this related rate is very powerful stuff. I mean there's always talk of movement and what it what rate is this changing at and we can use calculus to do these problems and this is another good reason why I gave you those handouts especially the right triangle one because after doing that right triangle problem this problem even though it looks scary it really wasn't as long as as problem whatever it was what did I do problem number seven it wasn't as long as problem number seven on the related rate sheet and they were asking for four things so that is the deal. Let's move on. Let's do a few more review problems. We'll jump into chapter four, 4.1. They ask us to find critical points. So how do I find critical points? Um, it's where, I, where the derivative is zero or where the derivative is undefined. So we've got to take the derivative first and then we'll go ahead and set things equal to zero. Okay, the derivative of t squared is 2t. Okay, over here I'm going to have to do with the with the logarithm, I'm going to have to do the chain rule. So the derivative of ln something is 1 over the something. And then we take the derivative of the something, which is 2t. So this gives me 
2t minus 4t all over t squared plus 1. Okay, so I want to make this into one fraction because that's going to help me with the critical points of the critical numbers. So multiply bottom and top of this thing right here, this 2t, by t squared plus 1. Okay, so now that I have that, this is going to be 2t, t squared plus 1, minus 4t on the top of the fraction, and on the bottom we have t squared plus 1. Okay, I'm going to simplify the top. I'll distribute the 2t. So this is 2t cubed plus 2t minus 4t. This is all over t squared plus 1. So we could um, combine like terms. So this equals 2t cubed minus 2t all over t squared plus 1. And if you want, you can factor out a 2t out of the top. It's not going to cancel with anything on the bottom, but it, it looks pretty. 2t, and then we have t squared minus 1. This is all over t squared plus 1. This is your derivative. Okay, what are we asked to do? We are asked to find the critical points. To find the critical points, that's where the derivative is 0, in which you set the top equal to zero to find those ones. And it's also where the derivative is undefined and you would set the bottom equal to zero. But let's set the top equal to zero. When I set these guys equal to zero, I mean you can either do difference of squares or you know, let's just let's just do this here. 2t equals zero, t equals zero, t squared minus one equals zero t squared equals 1. Square root property says t is going to equal plus or minus 1. So we get three values here. Now when you set this one equal to 0 for the bottom, you get t squared equals negative 1. t equals plus or minus square root of negative 1 or plus or minus i. We don't want to go there. So when they're asking you to find the critical points, they only want the real number critical points. So the critical points there then would be three. So this right here, these are imaginary numbers. And there's a time and a place for those, but not on this problem. So our critical points, which they ask us to find, would be zero, negative one, positive one. Or you can be lazy and go zero comma plus or minus one. Okay, so there's three of them. And sometimes these critical points end up being local mins or maxes and we'll be getting into that later on. Okay, problem number 53 in 4.1. It says to find determine, sorry, determine the location and value of the absolute extrema, those are the absolute mins and maxes, of your function on this time, well we say time interval, but this is an x interval from point 0.1 to 1. Okay. So how do we do this problem? Well, we Take the derivative, set it equal to zero, and then if any of those critical numbers end up in this interval, we'll go ahead and see what the values are, and we're gonna we're gonna pick 
the smallest value and the largest value. And we're also going to take these endpoints. So let's go ahead and I think the first thing that we want to do is take the derivative. Okay, because we have to see if there's any activity within this interval, if there's any critical numbers or critical points within this interval that might give us um, an absolute maximum or an absolute minimum. And this is exactly what you do in game theory. So there's a whole branch of math called game theory where you have this region and it's not an interval. Now it's actually this region on the xy plane and you have a function flying over it and you, you do the same thing. You're trying to find the absolute max so you can maximize your strategy. But it all has to start at a lower dimension in this class. So if there are some of you who do take game theory, you'll go, oh yeah, we did that in calculus one. So the first thing we want to do is take the derivative. Before we take the derivative, let's write this as y equals 2x to the x. So you have um, variable in the base and variable in the exponent. So this is going to be logarithmic differentiation. I'll write that out. So I'm going to go ahead and zap both sides with the derivative with respect to x, d dx. And so the, the derivative, oh wait, can't do that yet. Okay. Um, oh, what's happening to this whiteout? Why, why do I not want to do that? Because I want to ln both sides. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ln, sorry about that, y equals ln, I was just derivative gun happy. Sorry about that. They might take my license away now. Okay, so I ln both sides and I'm going to take this power of the argument of the log and jump it out front. So this is ln y equals x ln 2x. Now, I can take out the derivative gun. Watch the muzzle. Okay. So the derivative of ln something is 1 over something. And then we put a little marker there because it's with respect to x. And then um, right here is the product rule. Okay, so we have a product. This guy right here. And this guy right there. And so we say the derivative of the first times the second. Plus the first times the derivative of the second, which is a little chain rule. The derivative of ln something is 1 over something times, now the derivative of something is just 2. So let's clean this up a little. Um, well, before we clean it up, we could also multiply both sides by y. And so y prime equals y. Then this is ln 2x. I don't need the parentheses because 2x is one term. And then this guy right here just becomes 1 plus 1. So it looks like I need another piece of paper. Here's the piece of paper right here. So it looks like I have y prime equals. Oh, so what am I doing? Um, I've got to replace this y with something with x's in it and look we know what it is. It's going to be 2x to the x power. So y prime equals 2x to the x power times this right here. ln 2x plus 1. Okay, what am I going to do with this derivative? I'm going to set it equal to 0. I'm trying to find the critical points. Um, I have a product that equals zero, so I set each 
factor equal to zero. Now over here you, you run into some problems because you know if, you might say well x is zero gives me zero but then when you have something to the zero power that gives you one so we're going to deal with stuff like this later on when we learn something about L'Hopital but right now this gives us a dead end there's no solution for this this is the one we're interested in so over here we are going to solve for ln 2x and this equals negative 1. I'm going to exponentiate both sides. You could also change forms from log form to ex, um, exponent form. On the left hand side that property of logs e to the ln 2x that thing goes pop and you just get a 2x. 2x equals e to the negative 1. Divide both sides by 2 you get x equals e to the negative 1 over 2 or you can write it as 1 over 2e. Now the interval that we're searching for the absolute min and the absolute max is this interval right here. Okay, does 1 over 2e fall in that interval? Well that's hard to do without a calculator so if you pull out a calculator I'll round to three decimal places and what I ended up getting when I put that on the calculator is point one eight four does it lie in the interval and the answer is yes now if it didn't we would throw that away but because it lies in the interval now there's three people who are competing there's like a little election going on here and so you've got to go f of point one f of one we were always going to do those two and then anything, any critical number that lands within that interval, he is now in the running to be local max or local, not local, sorry, absolute max or absolute min. Now, there are times when this guy, this critical point, ends up being nothing and he loses the contest because that guy wins for max and that guy wins for min. So let's see what you would do. You would plug these guys where? into your original function. Your original function set f of x equals 2x quantity raised to the x. So you would be doing this hopefully, I mean two of these at least, on a calculator. And when you do this, stuff like this, so when I did this on the calculator, I mean you can, you can go 0.2 raised to the 0.1 power, you end up get, uh, get approximately, and I'll round to three decimal places, 0.851. Now when I put 0.184, or you can go 1 over 2e on your calculator, however you want to do it, you end up getting 0.832. We still don't know who wins the contest because we have to put 1 in here. Now 1's pretty simple to do because you put 1 in for x, you get 2 raised to the 1 power, which is 2. Now we can see who's the winner. Which one is the highest value of those three values? This one is the top dog. And that's in this interval here. And then who's the lowest? which number is the lowest of these values? This guy right here. 0.83 is lower than 0.85. So this is the bottom dog, which I don't even know what that means, but it's the bottom dog. I'm still using the word even though I told you I didn't know what that means. And so they said determine the location and value of the absolute extrema. So we have the absolute max the x value is 1 and the y value is 2, so this is 1 comma 2. And the, the absolute min happens to be this guy right here, which is um, 
four comma point eight three two. Now your book, sometimes they would say, oh, well, you know, we know that this is one over two E, and then they'd get the other one just by plugging one over two E into this function, and I'm not gonna show all the work on this, but you know, some, but this is not important. We won't, we won't even box this, and they'll say this is one over E to the one over two E power. Okay. And, and in terms of applications, it's, it's, it's this is better. So we have that right there. Now the first coordinate is the location. Okay, so they said location and value. So the first coordinate is the location of each of those. And the second coordinate is the value. So on the, on the exam, if I say, hey, what's the location of the absolute max? You would say one. And if I said, what is the value of the absolute max? You would say two. So let me, you know what? I, I'll write that down. So the first coordinate is the location. And the second coordinate is the value. So there it is. And you know, don't worry about this right here. I only did that to freak you out. And if I had given a problem like this on the test, I would have said round to three decimal places. Okay, but if I didn't say round, then you know, we'd have to do exact answers. And that, that is quite painful. So why don't we go ahead and do a few more problems. Bug number 10, so we'll just do two more problems. Bug number 10 and then something from 4.2. And bug number 10 really is 4.2, it's the mean value theorem. And um, let's go see what, what we're doing with this. The first part of bug 10 was just asking for average velocity. And then the second part says, find all times that satisfy the conclusion of the mean value theorem. So average velocity, I don't even have to take the derivative to get the average velocity. The average velocity is gotten by going s, that's the position function, of n time minus s of beginning time, which is two seconds ago, and then I go two minus a negative two. So S of two, hmm, so if I put um, two in there, I get negative eight. And then I have um, two in here, that's gonna give me negative 16, and then minus two, and then plus three. Okay, so that's the first part. And then this part, negative two, okay, so this is gonna be a little confusing, well, hopefully not too confusing. We put negative two in there, negative two cubed, quantity cubed is negative eight, but there's a negative in front, so this is eight. Negative two goes here, that gives you four times four, which is 16, there's a negative, so minus 16. And then we have a minus negative two, which is a plus two, and then we have the plus three. This is all over four. So let's just write it all out, negative eight minus 16 minus two plus three, I don't know why I'm writing it all out, minus eight, and then plus 16, minus two, minus three. And so we can cancel some things out like the 16s and the threes. I'm just trying to add this all up. This is all over four, by the way. So what do I have here? Negative eight. Another so negative 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So negative 20 over 4, which is negative 5, negative 5, and this is average velocity feet per second. So this is not gotten by taking a derivative. We, we are just doing the average velocity in a time interval. So this is like old stuff that we've covered. Now here's the new stuff. It says find all times that satisfy the conclusion of the mean value theorem. What the mean value theorem says is if you've got this nice continuous function, a differential fun differentiable function, um, sorry, the function is differentiable in this time interval, and it is, it's a nice polynomial, then there's a time within this time interval that has an instantaneous velocity of negative five feet per second. That's what the mean value theorem says. So what we need to do for this part is actually compute 
the instantaneous velocity function, which is just the derivative. So this is um, negative 3t squared minus 8t minus 1. Okay, so what do we have to do? There is some time within this time interval where this, um, where the instantaneous velocity equals this average velocity of negative 5. So I think I'm going to use another piece of paper here. And what I really have to do is take the velocity function, which we just computed right here. So I'll just repeat this. V of t equals negative 3t squared minus 8t minus 1. And set that equal to negative 5. And we're going to see if we can solve that. Okay, so this equation right here has lots of negatives. I'm going to just multiply that equation by a negative 1 on both sides. So this is 3t squared plus 8t plus 1 equals 5. And then what I'm going to do is get everything on one side by subtracting 5. So I have 3t squared plus 8t. We have minus 4 equals 0. Does this thing factor? Let's see. Factors of 12 that subtracting give you 8. 1 and 12, no. 2 and 6, well, they have to subtract to give you 8, so no. And 3 and 4, no. Okay, so this is out. So this means I have to do the quadratic formula. Quadratic formula. So this is your A, this is your B, this is your C. T equals negative boy. Couldn't decide on a radical party. The boy was a square. He lost four awesome chicks. It was all over by 2 a.m. There's my quadratic formula. So let's go ahead and plug things into the quadratic formula here. Minus 8 plus or minus the square root of 64, because that's 8 squared, minus 4ac. So um, minus 4 times a times c. Well, one of those is negative, so it's going to be a plus 4 times 4 is 16 times 3 is 48. This is all over 2 times a, which is 6. So what I have here is I have um, negative 8 plus or minus the square root of, you add those together, so this is 112, this is all over 6. Now, um, on the bug 10 handout, it said round to two decimal places, I believe. Two decimal places. So, I went ahead and put these in my calculator, and I ended up getting point four three. And the other one is negative 3.10. Okay. What was our original time interval? It was from negative 2 to 2. So do any of these lie in there? And, what, and we should have at least one of them lying in there. So it says, says find all times. So sometimes it could be two times that lie in there. Well, it just seems like this one does not lie in there, and this one is. The 0 0.43 is in that interval. So 0 0.43, this is an approximation, seconds. So what does this really mean? This means that the bug has an average velocity of negative 5 feet per second over this time interval. Well, there's a time in that time interval, which is 0.43 seconds, that if you put into the instantaneous velocity function, you would get really close to negative 5. And so that finishes problem number 9. We have one more problem to do, and that will end this review. Maybe this review was a little too long, but you didn't have to watch the whole thing. And I know what you're thinking now. Sure, now he tells us. But you never really did have to watch the whole review. Some of you already 
um, have been studying hard. So let's go ahead and do problem number 12. It says determine whether Rolle's theorem applies. If so, find the points guaranteed to exist by Rolle's theorem. So what is Rolle's theorem? It's just the mean value theorem um, where the average velocity is zero. So let's determine whether Rolle's theorem applies. That's what we're going to do first. Um, and actually, if it doesn't apply, then we're done. So we want to know the average velocity. And so to find the average velocity, all I have to do is go f of end time minus f of beginning time all over end time minus beginning time. OK. So f of pi over 2. So sine of 2 times pi over 2, sine of pi is 0 and then minus sine of 2 times 0 sine of 0 is also 0 this is pi halves on the bottom so yes the average velocity is 0 that is the um one of the conditions of Rolle's theorem another condition is the condition and you know I think in Rolle's theorem it says like f of this guy equals f of that guy. I mean, that's what we have, really. So the average velocity is 0. This is a nice function. It's differentiable within this um, interval. So we'll say Rolle's theorem applies. So there is a time within this time interval that has the instantaneous velocity of zero. So how do I find that? First, I want to take the derivative. I want to find the velocity function. So here is f prime of x. The derivative of this is the chain rule. Um, the derivative of sine of something is cosine something. I'm going to be a little tricky on this one. And then the derivative of something is 2. I'm just going to throw the 2 right there. OK. I'm going to set the derivative. So remember in the last problem, I set the derivative equal to 5. No, it was negative 5. I set the derivative equal to negative 5 because that was the average velocity. Well, the average velocity here is 0. And Rolle's theorem is just a special case of the mean value theorem. And so now. I have this equation right here. I'm going to try to solve for x. Divide both sides by 2. So I have the cosine 2x equals 0. Replace the 2x with a variable like u or w, whatever you want to do. So I'm going to say cosine u equals 0. Where does the cosine equals zero. We can draw a graph here and see. The cosine equals zero right here at pi halves and at three pi over two and here at five pi over two, etc. And then over here at negative pi halves. So I'm just going to say that u equals negative pi halves, and the list goes on, pi halves, 3 pi over 2, etc. But what is u really? u is 2x. So we'll go back to black ink. 2x equals things on this list. So negative pi over 2, pi over 2, 3 pi over 2. I know we can be more formal with an i and a j or whatever. I don't know. So I'm going to divide everything by 2 to get what x equals. So x equals um, negative pi fourths, pi fourths, 3 pi over 4, etc. Um, do any of these land within this time interval? And the answer is Yes, this pi over 4 lands right in the middle there, but it doesn't have to be right in the middle. So the answer then, 
find the point guaranteed to exist by Rolle's theorem, x equals pi over 4. 3 pi over 4 falls out of that interval, and same with any of the negative ones on the other side. So what this really means in terms of velocity is at time pi over 4, the bug has velocity 0, which is the same as the average velocity within this time interval. So this completes the review. Study hard, and I'll see you in the next video.